variety of attitudes towards God, what is your attitude towards him? This is a question that deserves a little bit of attention as we begin this course in Christian spirituality. In childhood, we have a variety of attitudes towards God too, but many of them, depending on our religious education, tend to be tinged with certain childhood fears, or if our parents were a little severe or exacting, we may have picked up ideas about God that reflected uh, their uneasiness or their guilt feelings about this or that. And somehow the, the feeling uh, can be communicated to a child that God is, is a rather dangerous character. Uh, later, we, we'll speak more of this, but right now I would like to emphasize the fact that uh, the spiritual journey has great difficulty in getting off to a good start if we are carrying with us a negative attitude towards God, which will be like a ball and chain around our uh, our emotions, if not our feet. It, it's important to have a good idea of God, and, and a good idea of God consists, of course, in trusting Him. And so how you communicate to a child this trust is a very important consideration for parents and teachers of, of, of these little people who for whom the attitude that we communicate about God is probably going to stick with them for weal or for woe all through their lives. And sometimes, in my experience, I have seen God have to go to incredible lengths to try to dissipate some unrealistic and unwholesome idea of him or her that uh, could have been avoided had, had we received in early childhood this disposition of trust, which parents, by their goodness and care of the child, are intended to, to manifest. That's part of their vocation as a parent is, is to show the kind of love that God has for the child by the way they uh, treat us love us, care for us, nurture us, and, uh, and all the rest of the parental virtues. Now, uh, let's move to, to a, a point in our early childhood education when we began to receive religious instruction, or maybe instruction that we received in catechism prior to confirmation. Now, this is the period when, uh, prior to Vatican II, a certain attitude or syndrome of attitudes about God tended to be communicated to uh, those in the catechism class that might be called a model of Western uh, spirituality. But I would say that spirituality should be put in quotation marks in this case because that particular uh, understanding of God was not a true spirituality, or at least one that represented uh, faithfully the teaching of Scripture. Remember that, that it's only since Vatican II in a general way that uh, Christians, or Catholics in particular, have been encouraged to read the Bible. Only recently that, uh, that we hear the Bible read in a language we can understand when we go to the liturgies. But unfortunately, prior to Vatican II, the general sense or environment in which religious education was communicated seems to have been more of a philosophical model stemming from Descartes with his dualistic view of reality and reinforced by Newtonian physics with its idea of God out here managing the world from a distance 
And, and it's corollary that those who wanted to be united to God would have to climb an infinite number of stairs in order to get to wherever heaven was. In other words, heaven was identified as a kind of geographical location somewhere off there someplace where nobody knew where it was. And, and, and so its access was difficult even in a spaceship. Well, at this point, uh, we might call this model of, of uh, Christian education as the Western model, which is characterized by the self outside of God and God outside of the self. Now, now this model, as you can see with a little bit of analysis and reflection, would, would suggest to someone engaged in trying to be united to God or make oneself pleasing to him, but would require efforts on our part in order to please God. And these efforts, since God is out there someplace, would obviously be the result of our natural capacities, efforts, and talents. Now, with this model in mind goes certain other attitudes. And these attitudes have been delineated, it seems to me, rather accurately for those who receive this kind of religious education in their childhood by uh, a uh, professor at Creighton University, uh, Father Richard Hauser, who has for many years uh, been a kind of campus minister as well as teach children and, has, uh, and his college students have reflected these dispositions, and this is even after Vatican II. Well, notice what these are and see if you can recognize them as having been communicated to you in whole or in part in your early religious education. This is the Western model influenced by philosophy more or at least significantly than by Holy Scripture itself. And uh, the first uh, attitude that goes with this syndrome is external acts are more important than internal acts or motivation. Now this is clearly contrary to the whole of the gospel. As, and only have to think of the f battle that Jesus had with the Pharisees precisely for this reason. But their motive for their religious observance was the external <laughs> Uh, completion of the ritual, whatever it was, or the good acts. And their motive was rooted in the worldly motives of human respect, satisfaction, and of adulation from the people. They even went to such lengths as blowing a trumpet when they were giving alms and wearing long uh, phylacteries and tassels uh, for show. And Jesus excoriates these observances perhaps more harshly than, than he certainly does any other sinners. In other words, he's much more gentle and loving with the prostitutes and the tax collectors who were extortioners than he was with these religious paragons of piety whose motivation was shot through with their own desires for self-aggrandizement and, and the glorification of their own egos. Okay. Well, let's move on to the second attitude that went with this disposition. And that was, the self initiates all good intentions and good works, and God rewards. Now, this gives us an image somehow of, 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 of our poor little self in this arena, working like mad to please God, and God is in the bleacher someplace, watching this adventure or this contest, and if we do well, it's thumbs up, to use the old Roman arena symbol. If it's not so hot, it's thumbs down. And so this gives us, what, is, what possible idea could one get uh, of the ultimate reality from such a caricature? The next syndrome is that the, the emphasis is on reward in this life and in heaven rather than on the love and union with God and love of neighbor here and now. Now this was the concern, of course, that 
manifests itself in the idea of external works and piling up certain merits in order to require God, it would seem, to give us his, uh, his reward in heaven. And so this is the mentality that seemed to have gone with what would represent in those days a good Catholic life. Well, you can touch off the various points. To get to Mass on Sunday and Holy Days of Obligation, to fast and abstain on the appointed days every Friday, to contribute to the support of the pastors, uh, not to marry non-Catholics, to go to the Eucharist once a year and confession prior to that, <laughs> and uh, perhaps if you were very devout, to join the Altar Society or the Holy Name Society, and then be sure to call the priests on time so that you could receive the last rites pass into glory and to receive your stockpile of merits which have accrued numerically, you might say. Now, th this, of course, is a, is a little a caricature of what a good Catholic was in those days, but not too far off the beam. And, and this was the fruit of the idea that we institute our good works, and hence God has a kind of obligation to reward. So the whole idea of merit which has some merit, was misunderstood in this context and exaggerated out of all proportion and with a certain a blissful disregard of what Scripture has to say about these things. And finally, the emphasis of the Western model was on uh, getting guarantees of future reward and happiness rather than on being concerned for loving and being united to God in this life and uh, in serving others in need. Okay, now let's look at the scriptural model. Now the scriptural model, which is, was recovered through the efforts of many Christian uh, scholars uh, prior to Vatican II, but received an emphatic endorsement in the great documents of Vatican II, this return has, has enabled us uh, as, a, as a church to recapture once again the basic gospel teaching and its values from the pure source. In other words, we don't have to depend on somebody's homilies or on or the translations of the, of the gospel. The best uh, uh, translations of the gospel probably now put us in closer contact with the Word of God than any generation since the uh, apostles. Because we now have, through the scholarly process of, of, of examining the cultural background, the meaning of words, uh, the evolution of cultures, we now have a better understanding of what the mind of the scriptural author was when they wrote these various passages. And the possibility now of daily, constantly encountering the Word of God in the most authentic texts that are possible with all the resources of hermeneutics and modern scholarship. So what does this model turn out to be? It almost is 180 degrees in the opposite direction from the Western model with which most of us were afflicted that's the only word I can think of, uh, when we were educated in the milieu of pre-Vatican II uh, religious education, or especially catechism. And, and what does Scripture say? It says that interior motivation is more important than the external acts that we perform. Just the opposite of the Western model. Which, which put emphasis in the other direction. The second point the, uh, is, was the question of uh, who initiates the good works. In the Western model, it was the self outside of God. In the scriptural model, it's the self in God and the Spirit of God in us. As Paul says 
you are the temple of the Spirit who dwells in you as a living and dynamic source of inspiration, who's communicating the gifts by which we can translate the divine will and love into daily activities on a whole range of different activities from prayer to action to service. And now the emphasis is on listening and responding to the Spirit rather than our own bright ideas and initiating all kinds of projects that we then expect God to back up, which he never thought up in the first place. Hence, <laughs> this, this is, is extremely important. So now, in, in the context of Scripture, recovered <laughs> since Vatican II, we, we, we learn to listen to the Word of God and not try to tell the Word of God, so to speak, what we're going to do, and he darn well better reward us. So that brings us then to the third comparison. And here, in the scriptural model, the emphasis is not on the reward of the self in this life or the next, but on the, on the effort and, and journey to unite ourselves and to love God here and now, right now, and to serve others in need and to love our neighbor as ourselves now. And so notice again, the focus is about 180 degrees different, totally opposite almost from the other. Now in fairness to the Western model, there was a certain uh, uh, abstract recognition of the importance of the spirit. But in my youth, the spirit was called the forgotten guest. My God, that's like forgetting that you've been married and wondering who this woman or man is in your house. The answer is, you married the guy, you're united to him, you can't be get rid of him. And, and so here, here we were, not knowing as Christians what the most important guest or a relationship in our whole lives was all about, and we're thinking that it isn't even there, for heaven's sake. Well, <laughs> this obviously did not facilitate the spiritual journey. Who can start a journey where after you take the first few steps and fall down as we are, you, you can't, you imagine how many more steps it's going to take to climb up to heaven someplace, in the sky. So you just say, I guess it's not for me. Uh, leave it to the trappers or some other cloistered <laughs> people, or maybe priests, and then you get the corollary. Well, write them a letter and have them pray for you. Then you won't have to pray anymore. So in other words, you have a certain group of people uh, who are elite who, who do the praying for you so you can do your own thing. And as long as you fulfill the ritual obligation, Sunday mass, no meat on Friday, blah, 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 then God has to reward you, and, and, uh, and on your tombstone you can write, I was a faithful Catholic. Baloney! <laughs> you, you were completely misinformed. In other words, a faithful Catholic is someone who lives the gospel, not reads about it, or tries to manipulate God to fit into our particular state of life. Notice in the Western model, we even had the idea that God must reward us now. And this, this blissful piece of ignorance or misreading of the gospel is what justifies uh, some of our uh, other brothers to claim that one of the rewards of practicing the gospel is that you'll be well-to-do and rich and, and uh, that you won't have to worry about anything and the trials don't happen to those who serve God. This, this is, a, is a teaching. I don't know what book of scripture says that, but anyway, this, this idea that if we initiate good works, like give alms to people generously, then God should reward us, but preferably here and now, as well as in heaven, by a nice uh, property, a nice house, a great professional success, uh, marbles in our ministry, etc., etc. As far as I can see, the scriptural model offers no such promises, and in fact, in the Beatitudes, which is God's idea, or, or at least the idea of happiness that Jesus puts before us, the happiest people are those who are persecuted, and the poor in spirit who have nothing. 
and and uh, uh, above all the willingness to suffer affliction for God's sake as as the example of the people whom God is most interested in. Just pick up the Psalms anywhere. The hero of the Psalms is obviously the, the, the person who is, suffers affliction for the sake of God of some other kind. And this, the, the, the needy, the poor, the oppressed, the afflicted, is constantly the concern of the psalmist and the psalmist as expressing the divine concern for the welfare, the protection, the deliverance of, of the poor. So how you can get rich richness as a reward for something out of the gospel is beyond me. Well, uh, let us turn now finally to the fourth disposition that the model of Scripture presents to us. That is, the model of the self in God and God in the self through his spirit and through the risen life of Christ within us through faith and trust and love. Now this final comparison deals again with an emphasis. The emphasis in the scripture model is on cultivating union and love of God here and now and not worrying about the future. In other words, it's not interested in guarantees for the future. The, the, the whole syndrome of reward and punishment, in actual fact, belongs to an attitude towards God, which springs from a fairly immature attitude that is normal for children, but should have developed into a more mature vision in an adult if their ed religious education had been truly adequate, and, and the only way to make a religious education adequate is practice. That is to say, a discipline of prayer and action that awakens our whole being to the contemplative dimension of the gospel, which is the, to be under the inspiration of the Spirit, both in prayer and action. Now, we can't just blame our religious educators. They received their information from a previous generation. And there are historical uh, situations that, that brought about this gradual reshaping of the model of the scripture into a model that was influenced by the contemporary philosophy and culture and presuppositions of, of the time. What happens to someone who is not worried about guarantees for the future? Obviously, there's somebody who trusts in God and who knows that if they do what they can to love and serve God and serve their neighbor right now, that God is going to take care of their future and they don't want a future. That isn't what God wants for them. So why bother about it? And they look to find God more and more in the present moment, which is the only place he can be found. Since God is eternal, he's not a future being. He's present now. And our discipline should concentrate on the work that is to be done now to develop a mature Christian attitude and relationship to the ultimate reality whom Jesus revealed as Abba, that is the God of infinite compassion, who is passionately, if I may use that word, concerned and present to the human family, which manifests his inner life more than any other aspect of creation. And so God is, especially by the incarnation, is manifesting his identification with the human condition. Hence, our attitude towards him has to be governed by that revelation and not by some philosophy or some scientific discovery which might change in the next generation.